But here we go. We still got some loyals in here. See Joe DeRosa, <laughs> see AJ. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, actually, we got uh, some special guests coming in today um, from the relatively new podcast. They're in, they're into their second season now. Um, but we got Val and Zyrus from In the Zone with VNZ. What's up, guys? What's going on? Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, we got you. Okay. Yeah, good, good morning, good. gentlemen. How you guys doing? Oh, we're doing all right. We had some tech technical difficulties at the beginning, but it's all good. I think oh, we're on track now. I know that's going all too well. Yeah. <laughs> uh, are, is everybody local to at least the New York Northeast region here this morning? Yeah. Yeah, it's terrible. This weather yeah. is just absolutely goddamn terrible. Yeah. Every Friday. Every yeah. Friday. It's, it's, it's rain or snow. Yeah, I'm past it. It's, yeah. it's just, it's bad. I got to bring my kids to school every morning and kind of like sit out and wait and this stuff. And it's just no, no bueno yeah. anymore. Yeah, so. this is this is now going on, what, seven months? Yeah, I had to get my weekly uh, com- coming in and complaining about the weather out of the way here. Oh, yeah, um, ain't nothing wrong with that. That's it. How about down there in the southern New York region for you, uh, Chris and Joe? How's it going down there today? It's not terrible. I mean, it's not great, though. Um, I don't know, Joe. What, Joe, can you tell us what the name of your neighborhood is again? Well, Chris, on Roosevelt Island, it is certainly uh, not of the best conditions, but not of the worst conditions. We are talking about a gloomy day that's kind of cold, no rain, but definitely not a spring, warm, inviting day. Yeah, it's yeah. Coming. Is the weather any different from uh, from where you came from? What was the last place you lived? I forgot. Well, Chris, the last place, the Joe East Side, was mostly the same since they are in the same region of the city. I feel like there's an inside joke here somewhere that I'm missing because I didn't watch Joe's show this week. <laughs> is, that, is that what's going on? Am I out on the joke? He moved from the Joe East Side to Roosevelt Island. Yeah. Okay, yeah, I was on their Sabres watch party, just stopping in to, you know, say hi, join the combo for a little bit, and I've, I've had that inside joke with my roommates and people at work, and I just threw it out there without even thinking about it, and it got a, got a chuckle or two, there you so go. now it's just referred to as Rose, Roosevelt Island and uh, the Joe Ruiz East Side, and yeah, that's my stupid pun. <laughs> and that's down in southern New York, right? Yeah, yeah, in uh, Manhattan. Yeah, we're just full of inside jokes tonight. <laughs> yeah, right. That's it. Anyways, <laughs> well, let's talk some, about some bills here. We got some guests here. Um, what has changed since we last talked? Taylor Rapp is a Buffalo Bill. Um, George, George Phillips, Phillips is, back. is back to being a Buffalo Bill. There has been some back and forth. We talked about it this week on our show, Chris. The back and forth on Tim Graham's report of that trade for DeAndre Hopkins that we spent all week last week talking about needing um, significant changes uh, in order for a trade to actually happen. But doesn't mean it's out. I think a lot of people took that as the Bills are out. So that's probably – did I miss anything else significant for the Bills right now? Lots of pro day visits scattered in throughout here. That's about it, right? Yeah, it's been slow. It's It's been slow at one Bills drive, but I guess we got to get ready for draft season now that we're about to hit April, right? Yeah, for sure. And that Tim Graham thing, I keep coming back to, like, that uh, he's, I don't know, he was just messing around. Like, he, he wasn't saying anything that was, like, we didn't already know. You know what I mean? Like, that, that tweet was yeah. all a bunch of nothing. Yeah. I have definitely been one of those people who read it as, well, we knew the Bills weren't going to trade them a second-round pick or even a third-round pick for DeAndre Hopkins, and no one was. And that second report that came out last week about, oh, the Cardinals are still asking for that, made me think, okay, well, they're doing this as a last gas before they end up changing their offer because they need to trade them. So no one is absolutely going to trade for that, and I think the Bills are one of those teams. So. As it stands, if the Cardinals are asking for that, then 100% the Bills are out. But that doesn't mean they won't jump right back in when the offer lowers. And I think Tim was actually just doing his job. And it's not something we wanted to hear in the moment, but it also lined up with all the other news about – 
DeAndre Hopkins in this trade a day before there was reports that uh, Kansas City was out until they were willing to eat some money. Uh, New England was in on it and same thing like unless Cardinals were uh, willing to eat something they were out and Bills did not get reported in that and it was quite the opposite. Bills were getting reported by a lot of people to be the front runners still and I think all Tim was doing was being at the league meetings, he's probably talking to somebody from the Bills, and they were all saying the same thing of just like, hey, Cardinals are being super unreasonable right now, and we are interested, but until they come off, we're in the same boat as all these other teams. And so I think he was just putting it out there as a reliable voice in the space um, that does have real good sources, that the Bills are officially also one of those teams that until the Cardinals come off, their ridiculous asking price are out. So it wasn't news we all shouldn't have known. It didn't mean the Bills are totally out on Hopkins or bringing in big-time receivers. It's just that the whole league is in lockstep that the Cardinals are drunk and they're going to have to come down on that value, and they will. Yeah, I agree. I think by draft day, we're going to find out what really may happen because I was just telling Zyrus that if we got – my timeline was in the next two weeks. We had hoped that they'll come down and a deal is made, but Zyrus brought up a good point in our last episode – and he said that, you know, we may get another A.J. Brown to Philly situation on draft day. So we'll see if that happens. I think it's likely you'd see a draft day trade at this point. I think they want to they wanna ask the highest they can for them while they still can. No one's going to bite. Eventually it's going to come down to, well, it's draft day. I know teams have players they want to get. They want to move up. They probably want to stack capital. Like, who would be willing to give us an offer that maybe we can – pump it up a little bit on draft day because we know that that kind of reeks of desperation for both sides and that maybe get something better than what we're anticipating at the moment. So I agree with that. Also, OBJ factors into this equation too in terms of leverage that like Hopkins is better. I think you add Hopkins, you get something better, but you're going to have to give up some assets plus pay something for this guy where OBJ is going to be sent out there, and I think teams that are in need or looking for that will have a little bit of leverage in saying, like, look, if you're not going to play ball with us, we're just going to go in another direction. Judy could be another one that the trade value comes down to more of a reality come draft day, and he could be a sneaky one. Like, there's going to be some guys that shake free here as well, not just Hopkins, but I do expect it to get done by the draft. Yeah, I, I wanted to bring up Judy as well because, you know, the, the team said they had no interest in, in trading him, but honestly, I don't believe that in the slightest. And I think a draft they trade for him would be perfect. I mean, all these, these teams want assets for this year's draft and don't want to go to next year's draft capital. So, you know, I mean, I, I wouldn't be surprised to see a couple of these guys move. Even OBJ signed right around draft time. We're, we're just waiting for one shoe to drop at this point. Yeah, you guys think there's any chance that um, that Ayuk is, ultimately is on the block? I mean, I know the reports came out that you know people were calling and San Francisco said, "No thanks, we're keeping him." But I mean, things change. That would be interesting, but I think they love him. I think they love him. I think I was hearing somewhere that they got him as one of the top 10 number two receivers in the league. And they felt like he did such a great job. So I honestly think 49ers would be crazy to put him on the block, but um, in this day and age of trades, you just never know. Yeah. I think they see themselves right now as all in on a Super Bowl window. Um, And I don't think they're up again. They're not in, in that bad of a situation where they would have to get past that. I think they're in a similar situation as the uh, Bengals probably feel that they are with Higgins and Chase and their weapons in that, like, hey, like, we're built on having some of these weapons uh, and getting the ball in their hands. And so just keep them as long as we can and keep the Super Bowl window open. Although the, I would say the Niners are even doing it with – less you probably need more from skill positions for the Niners to be successful right yeah and I think there's a giant question mark in their quarterback position like you don't have Jimmy G anymore Brock Purdy just had the UCL injury that might sideline him as far as we know for you know half the year or the full year even though they express confidence we don't know how he'll recover I don't think they're going to want to make that situation harder on themselves by getting rid of one of their most valuable targets just to make it harder for Lance when he comes back. And then, heaven forbid, you trade IU and Lance goes down. You know, what do you do? Are you going to draft another receiver? It just seems redundant to me to move him at this point. 
these guys on their rookie contracts, right? Like Ayuk and, and Judy's still on his rookie contract. I mean, I mean, uh, another dude that's not on a rookie contract, but I hear his name mentioned while I'm tweeting about it and stuff like that, and he does pop up is uh, Mike Evans down in Tampa. Might not be really he's wanting a, to. He's not on a rookie contract still, is he? No, I said not on a rookie contract, okay. but okay. in that in that same. <laughs> I'm say that dude's been around for a while. No, but he, I think he's in the last year of a contract right now, and so you, it would be similar to a DeAndre Hopkins type move where he's on a team that is not probably going to be uh, super competitive. We haven't heard him complain about that or wanting to move on at all, but I believe he is at least uh, when I checked on the last year of a deal. So could be another uh, potential again, not the typical receiver you see for Josh Allen in terms of like separation getting open, but he's just open because of his size and ability to go similar to Hopkins. Just go get the ball. I have a question for you guys. How you guys doing? All right. We good. We good. What's going on? What's up, AJ? Uh, Aaron, Chris, um, obviously I think most Bills fans are like on the same page with receiver early and getting a linebacker early. I think a lot of fans want that, but the biggest question mark and the most, you know, diverse opinion in terms of what the Bills should do in the draft is the tackle position. Uh, obviously, they got Questenberry back, who might who could possibly be the swing tackle. You got Dawkins, who's got a couple of years left on his deal, and then obviously the you know unknown of Spencer Brown. How confident are you in Spencer Brown to take the next step uh, this upcoming year? And also, how high do you prioritize the offensive tackle in this draft? Because I brought up a point. You know, if you go 27, but you're high on Spencer Brown, you could run into an issue where Spencer Brown wins the battle and, you know, those assets that you're using on a first-round pick might not be used again, like the Kyrie, the Kyrie Elam situation and then that whole narrative that Sean McDermott doesn't play rookies. So just your thoughts on the tackle position, what they should do with it. I think bringing in competition is necessary, and I think if a Darnell Wright's there at 27, you have to do it. But just your thoughts on the right tackle position and the possibility of the Bills adding one in the first or second round. Vel Zyrus, you guys want to jump in first on this? Yeah. Yeah, I'll hop in on this one. Go. Um, I, I definitely want to believe this I'll put it like that. Um, he's, he's shown flashes. So I mean, some really high in play, but the consistency has not been there at all. I mean, I mean honestly speaking, he's probably – the best athlete you have on the team as a whole, but you know, I, I would like to bring some competition in. I don't know if I want to do it from a first or second round standpoint because, uh, like you said, that potential is there for round to win that competition and then we're kind of passed out using the high end asset who's not going to be playing. Um, I would have loved to see a little bit more of a, a veteran depth position uh, to push him. But, you know, if we drafted one in the first or second round, I wouldn't lose any sleep because that, that right tackle is definitely the weakness on the offense. Right now. Yeah, I guess what? And also, yeah. And also that- I was just going to say, like, is the competition that you bring in the reason that Spencer Brown takes that step? Is that the fire? You know what I mean? Like, as of right now, to me, there's, you know, I, I hope that Spencer Brown takes the next step, but Aaron likes to say this on the cover one pod, Buffalo podcast all the time. What say it, Aaron? What's hope? No, it's not me. Uh, Greg, this is a Greg Thompson uh, quote is hope is not a plan. Uh, he brought this up because um, he started saying that to me because I was in on Dawson Knox. Big time. But it was like Joe Marino and I and everybody just wanted to trade for Zach Ertz. Nobody was like believing in Dawson Knox. But I had seen enough. And I, I uh, tried to apply the context of the position and where he was at coming in. The same thing that Spencer Brown folks are trying to do now in that, hey, he didn't you know play his final year. He was new to the position. He's a big dude. He's filling into his body. All this stuff. He had a back surgery. My issue where I don't see a parallel to where Dawson Knox was, and uh, I know I talked to Joe Marino about this quite a bit because he's higher on the possibility of Spencer Brown panning out than I am, but we were the same on Knox. So I reached out and said, like, you know, what are you seeing that I'm not? And he didn't do enough for me to convince me. Um, and I just I can't see the parallel for me that he is going to take that step. I, I, it feels a lot more Cody Ford to me than it does Dawson Knox. And the way Brandon Bean talks about him, 
also worries me a little bit. That feels very Cody Ford. Like maybe he gets a little hung on his own investments and his own idea of where a guy's going to develop. But uh, Spencer Brown's not done anything for me to not bring in real competition to protect Josh Allen. And so, yeah, if it's right at 27, I'm running that card up. And I don't know, Spencer Brown, like if you develop fantastic, we have a really good swing tackle and we have another asset and maybe we can move on from Deion Dawkins when that contract comes up, is. but I'm not planning, there right there. planning on that, you know? So, so is Aaron is your biggest, is it one of your biggest needs? Like, would you put it up there right at the top of your list going into the draft? Man, it's, it is up there. It is. And uh, but here's the thing I talked about with Greg a little bit because we were kind of having the philosophical debate on in this draft for me, I think it's a weak linebacker class. And I don't think there's any high end linebackers. I don't even think Jack Campbell really is probably a first round prospect. I would take him in that for late first round because I think you're taking mostly second round prospects there anyways. But the philosophical debate comes from like, do you overdraft that linebacker early? Because I actually do like a number of the tackles in this draft. I think you can get round two or three, a guy that can come in and be a better player than Spencer Brown is today. Um, so it is a priority for me, but it's a, like a priority that I think because of the depth of the draft versus other priorities the Bills have makes it kind of like a 1B, if that makes sense. I, I was kind of yeah. rambling on there, but if that makes sense. Yep, got it. Thank you. So I, I want to add one thing. Oh, I'm sorry, Chris. Oh, I was, nah, I nah. was just going to say this. Oh, sorry. It was in the zone. My bad, Matt. I just no, wanted no, to no, get no. this go one ahead. thing, too. Yeah, yeah go ahead. Um, for the Spencer Brown debate, so I, I have some – Obviously, I'm concerned about it. The thing for him, as in, like, in his defense, he was coming off some injury. He did miss some time to, you know, training camp and everything to get himself right, to get acclimated to the position as a full-time starter. Obviously, growing pains are going to happen when you're a young player, but couple in an injury, it makes it exponentially more difficult for him to get shored up and to become, you know, dependable, dependable in that spot. But my issue with it is, Again, hope is not a plan. You can't look at his athletic upside and not look at how he's actually played. With Spencer Brown, if he was a tight end, if he was a running back, if he was any position that didn't need to develop in a way that was quick or at least, you know, notable enough where we could be confident in him, I would say, yeah, let's get let's ride it out. You know, there's a lot of upside there. We could make this work. But he's the right tackle. The offensive line has been an issue, and you are talking about the position group that has to defend your most valuable asset and keep him healthy because you know he's going to run. You know he's going to take pressure in the pocket if Brown doesn't get it right. So for me, I think there's less of a window to wait for Spencer Brown, and I would much rather bring in the competition in the draft for him where if that player that you take ends up panning out, you now have that solution at right tackle to keep Allen safe, and if he doesn't, you're at the very least offering depth and offering competition for Brown to maybe take a step forward in the pass protection part of his game. Because I do think Brown is already a pretty solid run blocker. So just add in that extra step to maybe get someone who can pass protect and then you have a good right side of the line. And you're also going to get some more pressure taken off of Spencer Brown while also making him a viable person on your line. Yeah, Vela, why don't you weigh in and then I got a quick thing on this one. Then we'll move on to the next thing maybe. Unless anyone else has something to say. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I'll follow up to end it. So you you guys can go, then I'll follow. I'll yeah, follow yeah. Perfect. I was just going to add in quickly that I feel like it's definitely a position that got to get addressed. I'm just probably not on the same boat as people thinking that we need to definitely hop on it if it's there day one at 27. Um, just because I'm 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 very much so not pleased with where we're at at linebacker, but I do understand that this draft. He's probably not the best draft for a middle linebacker um, where we're at. You know, Campbell, obviously, if he's there at 27, I guess you get him. But he's more of a second round talent. I mean, or you could just, you know, trade back possibly um, and maybe get an additional pick. Uh, But I do think that we definitely do need to add at the tackle position. I'm more so thinking day two or day three. Uh, You know, would I be completely upset? No, but I'm kind of like. Um, our guy on 550 in the morning I'm kind of on that wide receiver train early where if we got one of the top let's say top four wide receivers available at 27 I'm leaning more towards that Um, so so I got tackled like third on my list but um, I wouldn't be upset but I'm, I'm not I'm not of the mindset that we have to do a day one if it lands in our lap I guess I'm 
okay with it, but I'm more so leaning towards day two or day three, definitely addressing that right tackle position and kind of just going from there. Yeah, yeah. For me, I mean, it's like I I want them to get a guy that they've got a first round grade on. And I'm less, I'm thinking less about the position. Obviously, we have positions of need, but when it comes to that 27th pick or the first round in general, you know, we saw last year they used a fourth round pick to trade up one spot to get Kyer Elam because he was the last first round grade left on their board. And I mean, I know they also needed a corner, so I'm sure that factored in, even though Brandon Bean is always preaching best player available. I don't uh, look if it, it doesn't matter so much to me if it's a tackle or a receiver or a D lineman, you know, defensive like interior D lineman or an edge. If one of these guys that one of the top 15 or to 20 guys, depending on how many of them have first round grades in on the Bills board, if one of them falls to 27 or one of them falls to like, 23 you know somewhere in that range where like maybe they can move up a little bit to grab them that's the priority to me whether it's darnell Wright or if like someone like skaronsky or roderick jones happens to fall if like one of the top three receivers happens to fall because like zay flowers is number four i think in a lot of people's minds i don't know so i guess some people might have hyatt above them but to me it's like you could, the top three guys are probably first round grades and then flowers and hyatt are more like second round dudes um, but they'll probably, there's obviously a good chance they get taken in the, at that back end of the first round. Um, so if one of the top three receivers is there, if one of the, you know, the top three or four tackles is there, um, that's who I want them to take because I just want to keep adding elite talent to this team where we can, even if it means giving up, you know, a later pick to, to move up a little bit, to grab them. Uh, I want to push back just a bit. I agree that I, if they, if those guys fall, but I, again, that kind of to me falls into hope is not a plan. Like hoping that uh, top fifteen, top twenty guy. We we talk about this a lot in the Cover One Slack. So and in our DM group, because I know Chris already knows this. I know AJ's uh, some of the guys. A lot of how we talk about is teams don't have 32 first round grades, right? That's not. I think some fans believe that's how it works and. Every single team is going to tell you after the draft that they had a first round grade on the guy they got, no matter where they got him. That's just, I think it's built into the terms and agreements of being a GM in the NFL. You have to say that. Um, but they're probably got like 20 guys that you have a first round grade on. Maybe some years you get into the mid to late 20s, but it's usually 20 or less that you have a, a hard first round grade on. I agree. If one of those guys does fall into your lap, yes, run up to the podium and grab them. But in terms of, uh, being in that late, you have so many options. Somebody brought back, uh, I think, in the zone was saying, you know, that trade back idea. I think that is a, another one. Again, hope is not a plan. You got to rely that some other team wants to come up and get that fifth year option or come up on a player. Um, and, and there's that kind of plan there too. But um, for me, it is. I know it's best player available, but I keep going into positional need on this team. This roster is so good at this point and it has so much depth across the board. Like I could still run, we're talking about Spencer Brown and his problems. I could still roll into a season next year with Spencer Brown and hide him with what they've done in free agency. Same with middle linebacker. Like I'm in a spot where I feel like you could roll into a season with however it shakes out between Tyrell Dotson and Terrell Bernard and Balen Spector and sort of hide that because the roster is so good, which I think gives them the flexibility to do a bit of a shift in their mix of having to draft for need plus best player available again, if that makes sense. I yeah. don't know if that linebacker philosophy is something I'd want to roll with, though, because one, it's unknown. Two, I don't think your D-line's good enough to mask the issues within your linebacker core. Like, we're talking about a, a D-line that was riddled with injuries that we knew was struggling with their pass rush, especially after Von Miller went down and was having a hard time stopping the run. I just don't think I'd be a person to say, oh, we can go into the draft and not take a linebacker because, you know, their coverage is good. The, the back end of the defense is great. I think it's the strongest it's been in years. But I really would be nervous going into a season where we didn't have a solid, at least a solid prospect at middle linebacker because that line, unless it gets addressed heavily, if there's a move that still has to be made, which there should be, uh, I just don't think it's good enough. I think if you're rolling into the season, 
with the linebacker room as it is. Because I agree with you, it's the top priority. But to me, if you don't get it in a trade back in day one, I don't think anyone to me, for what I've seen in the linebackers after Jack Campbell, is not a guaranteed improvement in 2024 in the linebacker room. And so I think you need to address the defensive line anyway. And I think that the chance to get the linebacker that is going to improve in free agency, I think that's already passed. And I think you have one shot in the draft from what I've seen. Maybe one of these guys will become another really good linebacker. and It would be a developmental guy or something like that. But I don't think in 2024 you're getting much better linebacker play right now than you already have in this room. So I think you need to address the defensive line anyway. And I think if you're rolling with Terrell Bernard, who they invested a third-round pick in, whether or not we agree in, in where he was picked and why he was picked, they do have a plan for him. And if you've invested in that, I also think we're seeing this idea with the Taylor Rapp signing of Sean McDermott maybe taking over, getting a little more aggressive. And I think the, that type of player and what I saw from him in college in the film room, Eric did on him, leans to a little bit that idea that Sean McDermott could get more aggressive and bring in more blitz packages and stuff like that. So maybe just see a shift of what we do at linebacker, some bigger defensive linemen and these guys blitzing more often. I could definitely see it. Like, I'm not trying to sit here and say, like, oh, if Campbell's gone and Simpson's gone, like, you know, go get, uh, you know, someone in the third round. That's our guy. Because I do think that there is a steep cliff that this linebacker class jumps, uh, jumps off as far as talent goes. But I more so mean, like, I just wouldn't feel comfortable if they didn't take Campbell or Simpson. I think that's just the need is outweighing. I'm sorry, I'm out of breath. Um, <laughs> the need is outweighing you know, other position groups on the team where if we're at 27 and you're, you know, I I love Zay Flowers. I love a lot of the prospects in the first round, but for me, unless a surefire tackle is there like a Darnell Wright or like a, you know, Anton Harrison or Dewan Jones, where you could be comfortable taking them at 27, I really would just feel like Campbell Simpson, that coverage linebacker is a no brainer. However, if they don't take it, then to me, it tells you, okay, McDermott's got a new philosophy. He's going to roll with the guys we have. Coverage change, you know, maybe using rat more and more different sub packages. And then we're talking about a new look defense that could work. I mean, you don't know that for sure. But yeah, I just feel like in the current state, if they don't have that change of philosophy and they don't take a linebacker, I think it's going to be kind of a growing pain struggle year for that middle part of the defense. Uh, we've had a couple of passing comments here about this, uh, you know, wide receiver in the need um, and early in the draft here. And I am struggling personally with the um, one where value of wide receiver is obviously the free agent class this year did not get the value that they were anticipating, even though we knew it was probably a lower end free agency class. We also heard a lot about how this draft class wasn't good all throughout the college football season. And this wasn't going to be a good wide receiver class, at least not in the top end Jamar chase, Justin Jefferson way that we've become accustomed to year in and year out with draft classes. But I've always liked this class a little bit more than most. And to me, it also feels like for the bills specifically, I know a lot of people are like, get that in round one, get one of those top guys. And unless one of the like top, top guys falls for me, I don't think the class separates itself much. And so I think for me, it's where maybe there isn't the super high end talent of a Jamar chase, but I do think you can wait on wide receiver and get some productive guys. The class doesn't blow me away, but there's plenty of undersized, speedy, shifty dudes that you can find that have sure hands that can be a developmental guy. And I think that's mostly what you're going to get out of this class is, even the guys that are going to be high end, I think we'll probably take a year or two to really get going unless they end up on a bad team that needs production right away. I don't think you've got the high end talent to justify like a first round pick again, unless a big foot like JSN really. Falls yeah, or Addison, or... Uh, you know what I mean? Like, but it's not, yeah, or Addison, but I don't think like, I know a lot of people are high on downs and I like downs and I agree with everyone that's kind of said that Beasley, vision for him in an offense i think you could get a lot of production but i don't know i'd still rather go 27 or linebacker i mean look i think i agree with you i think that the drop off you know from the the top wide receivers to the sort of the rest of the field is smaller than the drop off at linebacker at defensive tackle you know at tackle offensive tackle like I think that the guys that are, you know, those first round guys at those positions are the, it's just a bigger difference between them and the the rest of the options that you'd have if you wait. 
Right, Aaron, back to your original point with the whole hope is a plan thing and why I think receivers a more pressing need. And I'm not saying I think this wide receiver class is deep, like Jaden Reed, Jonathan Mingo, Xavier Hutchinson. There's guys that you can get in the later rounds, but if you're you sign Sheffield and Hardy, those are two guys that aren't really proven. Like, yes, they, I think they're upgrades I, I, on the film from what I've watched. Um, you know, they're better players than what they've had. But if you if you're losing, you know, if say, if say if Gabe gets goes down with an injury or, or digs, you're going to count on. And I know a rookie's still, you know, unproven. And but if you get one of those top guys, I just think it's important because I don't know if I trust unproven guy. Even Shakir, like Shakir showed showed flashes. Like I think he could be a good receiver, but he's also a fifth round pick, and you're banking on him developing just like the whole, you know, the rest of these young guys on the squad. So. I just think receiver is a need, but I get your point. I think it's a deep class. I don't think you necessarily have to go round one, but even taking a round three guy, I think. And the first top 90 picks I think is important just because I think there's a lot of unknowns with the depth at the roster. Um, but I, I still think they did upgrade and, you know, being had cost-effective moves. Val, you were talking about receiver. You got a, you got a guy at that spot that you'd, you'd be running up to the, to the podium if they're still on the board at 27? At 27, um, I would probably say the only two who I would really feel good about is if, if JSM fell, which that may be a miracle, um, or a guy like Quentin Johnston, um, just because of his frame. He looks like he can, you know, cover the big plays down the field. Um, he was a reliable threat in college. So maybe a guy like Quentin Johnston at 27 – um, you know, Zay Flowers, I'm I'm kind of in between him being like a early day two pick, late day one pick. So I wouldn't be mad with a guy like Zay Flowers. But I would say Quentin, Zay or JSN for me in the first round um, seem like potential fits for the Bills if they're if they go past 21, 22. But the more I think about it and, and listening to other people. I honestly think wide receiver is probably going to end up being more of a day two type of deal unless one of the big three or four fall in our lap at 27. So that's kind of where I'm at. Also, um, for AJ, that the point you make, I agree with you that if there's an injury uh, to one of the higher end parts of this receiving core, it's going to be devastating. Uh, but I think that's true of almost every team in the NFL right now, or if you like took out their number two receiver or popped out their number one, like the depth gets real hairy very quickly. Uh, maybe a couple teams are in a better position than the Buffalo Bills. I'm also a lot higher on Khalil Shakir. I think even though he had a lack of uh, usage and production, I think the um, idea that Sean McDermott won't use rookies is also an overstated thing. Uh, we actually have seen him play majority of the first round picks. A lot of guys have come in. I mean, Christian Benford was starting, getting starting reps just a year ago. So James um, Cook. I know he will. Yeah, James Cook got reps um, as the year went on. I do think the usage of some of the younger players has been suspect in in the philosophy, but it's not because Sean McDermott's unwilling to give rookies a chance. Um, With that said, I I think part of my the way I'm thinking about it, too, is I'm higher on Shakir. I am higher on a little bit on Deontay Hardy after seeing Eric talk about his potential in the offense. (laughs) Yeah. Um, And I'm high on James Cook, Naheem Hines, Dawson Knox. That all also bakes into this and plays into that for me where I agree with you. That depth gets real questionable if Gabe Davis goes out. Things are you're going to be pulling street free agents off the team. I want to add to this room. I just don't know that I think there's a the to me, there's this like movement out there where they have to just add tons of pour more gas on the fire go all in on that offense when i do think you still need a methodical approach to building a full roster that complements you i'm sure there, there are people right. who would I, say oh go ahead aj sorry dude yeah aaron to your point i just don't want to be in a situation like last year where yeah i, I get it like john brown and cole beasley they're familiar with the system and they you know they they were good players at one point but in 2022 and 2023 i just don't think that was a those are reliable guys. Um, so I, I just don't want to be in a position where you have to go to the free, like the chiefs, even what the chiefs did, like an MVS and then adding sky Moore and then getting Juju Smith Schuster. I know they lost Tyree kill and they were trying to fill that void, but just getting guys, I think rookies are free agents. And I know they've done that, 
But I would, I would just be more confident with one more guy um, just to round out that receiving core, possible wide receiver two, possible wide receiver three. Um, and then, you know, seeing what Shakir, Shakir has, what Hardy has, and, you know, bringing them along the, the way. Can I just – I know, Chris, you want to get something. And just – I hate keep pushing back on people. Uh, but I would say that uh, Gabe Davis is good as – um, Juju Smith Schuster is and MVS, like I think, and, and getting Sky Moore. I think Khalil Shakir is uh, good of as good of a prospect as a Sky Moore is. And so I think the Bills are like more on pace with the skill positions of those teams than it feels like because of how we saw the season end and the statistics on Gabe Davis just make it look terrible. But I think he's on par with those number two receivers in terms of like a good productive number two. Right. Don't get me wrong. I'm like, I'm, I'm higher on Gabe Davis than most. I have. I think he's a top 10 wide receiver too. Um, I know people like freak out on me, but I think he, I mean, yes, the drops are concerning, but his ability to, to make plays and be reliable in the big moments, if it's, if it's just a little more consistent and he can do it at a consistent level, um, I don't think people will have as many issues. He, he showed up in big games. I think complimenting him with another guy that can get separation over the middle of the field will really, you know, help him on the outside and, you know, make his game that much better. Um, so, yeah, I think I think Davis and Diggs are a good one-two punch and probably, you know, a top ten, top seven one-two punch in the NFL. Another thing, and I know it's a what-if statement, so take it with a grain of salt, but Gabe Davis doesn't go down in that Titans game and that injury doesn't linger into the Miami game. You're talking about him potentially having a 1,000 yards this year and maybe another touchdown. And if that were to happen, you think people's perceptions on him would change? Because I certainly think they would. I think Vel was speaking Randy Hard. I see you in here, Randy. He was talking about um, Quinn Johnson. I, I feel like re- I remember. I remember hearing Randy in one of these spaces talking about Quinn Johnson a lot. Um, and for me, when we're talking about taking a receiver possibly at twenty-seven, uh, I mean, I know that like Eric has said he likes say flowers a lot, and he would take him there without a hesitation. My only hesitation is, and I know like you know this shouldn't preclude you from taking a guy if you feel like he's the guy, but like if you have Deontay Hardy, you just brought in um, to me, like if they're going to take a receiver and I think they should take a receiver, I'd rather them take someone who's a little different from what we've already got, like a bigger guy, like someone who, you know, can, who's not um, like, just as an example, uh, I really like Jonathan Mingo. And I think if, you know, if they can, target him in like the third even if it means moving up a little bit um depending on how the board falls like he's a guy who just has a really big presence he's a physical guy um he can do a lot of that i'm not saying he's Debo samuel but he's in this a similar mold um that's something that we don't really have here right now um so that would be my one of my goals if we're targeting receivers is somebody who can uh bring something a little bit different to the room Would you guys all be out on B? Like, how do you feel about Bijan if he was there at 27 with, you know, restructuring Hines to keep him on the roster, drafting, using a second round pick on Cook last year, and then bringing in Damian Harris? Would you guys still take Bijan at 27 if he was there? I'd field trade back offers. It, like, if he's the only, if he's the only first round grade dude left on the board, I'd be, you know, I know that you brought this up in a space not too long ago, AJ. Um, so, you know, credit to you, but like, if there's somebody who's, if Bijan is still on the board at 27, there's got to be teams that are like just clamoring at that point, just losing their minds. You know, maybe you get Arizona to jump up seven spots from, I think they're at 34, you know, to get back into the first round to grab them. Cause I mean, who do they have? James Connor, who's 28 and kind of, you know, at this point, I mean, he's, he's fine, but like they could use a running back for sure. Um, so yeah, I mean, as far as taking him, I wouldn't be I wouldn't be like super mad about it. He's it's tough. That's that whole, you know, positional value conversation that comes in. Um, but it, <laughs> he's like Bijan is pretty much a consensus top 5 player in the draft. And I was going to say don't you have to take him if he's there? Consider that uh you just said that if you want to get a guy that they have to have a first yeah. grade on this guy. Right? Yeah, everybody does. There's no, I mean, yeah, yeah. The 32 teams have a first round grade on Bijan Robinson. So, I mean, yeah, like 
to the to what I was talking about earlier with getting a guy with a first round grade. I wouldn't be uncomfortable with taking Bijan there, but like, you know, I'd I'd be listening to if if teams were looking sure. to to grab that spot. I got to talk to it because I'm on the side of this almost every year, especially now that the Bills are picking towards the back of the draft consistently. It's not the same. Taking a running back at 27 just is not the same as taking one at 15 or higher. Like that's where in my opinion, the logic and the philosophy of no running back round one is in those top picks where you have legitimate guys with first ground grades, most likely still on your board, then becomes more of a positional value asset allocation. When you're at 27 and your roster looks the way the bills do, I know they have holes. I believe you can cover up some holes. Every team's got them. Uh, if you got a chance to add that dude, I'm taking them. And I honestly like, yeah, I would feel some trade offers if somebody really wants to come up. I'd add B. John Robinson to this roster in a heartbeat, and I would run him and James Cook to the ground for the next three, four years and just get him passes, get him looks, and take carries off of Josh Allen and use them on their rookie deals and then discard them as I continue to go on Super Bowl runs. I don't care. Just add really great players to this team. I'm cool with that kind of stuff. That- Agreed, AQ. Val Zyrus, where are you guys at on Bijan? For me personally, I couldn't turn it down. Um, if I have the opportunity to, to draft that level of top tier talent, I, I couldn't resist. I mean, granted, I don't think the running back room is actually actually necessary at the moment because I do feel comfortable going into the season with what we have now. But I mean, I'm all about just putting as much talent on this offense as possible and then allowing the coaches to put these guys in position to succeed. So. You know, you put him on your team and you figure the rest out. So if he's the best option that's available at 27, I have zero issues with picking him. Because, you know, like we said before, end of the first round, I don't care if I'm drafting a running back if, if they're worth it. Um, I'd rather go that route than forcing myself into a, a Jack Campbell situation when, you know, I don't feel the, the value is necessarily there. So if he's there, I'm, I'm, I'm actually running that card in because, again, I just want this team to have as much top-tier talent as possible. Yeah, me personally, I'm conflicted. I'm I'm not going to lie. I kind of love the idea of adding a guy like him because he is such a talented back, but I'm also I'm also kind of I think Chris said it. I'm I'm rolling with listening at least first before I run and grab the car because like someone mentioned, they'll have four or five teams possibly trying to grab a running back like him, and since we have three and I really like the idea of Damian Harris um, I, I know he's been, you know, hurt on and off a little bit the last couple of years, but um, yeah, I, I I love him for the talent that he is, and he would be at twenty seven. I just would be patient with the pick and kind of think about it first to see if we got some good offers out there, because I know a couple teams will probably be drooling. Uh, but yeah, I, I actually like our three headed running back room right now, but. Um, it, it would be very tempting. I'm, I'm just not. I wouldn't be knocking over tables to uh, send that card in. That's all. Would you be jumping through tables to send that card in? <laughs> See, that's a good one. Nah, <laughs> not even. You know, that, that's a good way to look at it. But I'm telling you right now, I think there are a couple teams out there that really, really could could really use him. And I'm not saying we can't because it would be a luxury to have him. But um. I'm more so – I'm still thinking about other positions. I know linebacker is probably not going to happen until day two based off based on the talent. Um, but, yeah, I don't know. That's a tough I, one. I, I, I think don't think – It'd be debated. But. I don't think we'll even have to worry about it. I bet somebody will scoop them up before we get to that conversation. For sure. Um, in my opinion, I think, I think teams are higher on them than Twitter. You might see someone um, trade up to get them before we even get to 27. Yeah. For sure. I think that someone's going to lock in on him probably in the maybe even late teens, early 20s there. Uh, Chris M's got his hand raised. Really respectful. What's up, Chris? Appreciate that. Nice manners. Yeah, um, I, I uh, like you said, I don't think he'll be there, Lijon, at 27. But realistically, if he is, what are we looking at for com- – what, what's, you know, realistic compensation for someone in, say, the top 15 of the second round trying to get the 27 to take him? 
Uh, so I brought up the the Cardinals scenario because they're at thirty four and they you know they'd be moving up seven picks. I was looking at the trade value chart. Let me just grab it real quick. Um, so that pick's worth one seventy five on the um, the Rich Hill chart, and that's around the third. So well, the difference between the but the Buffalo's pick at twenty seven which is worth 216 and that one it's like about 40 um so yeah that's like a late third or DeAndre Hopkins <laughs> True I actually actually um actually asked Joe Marino that I said I just said you know hypothetical um because you know with the Cardinals and the Hopkins thing I said swap picks our first for their second they take some money and then, you know, a conditional 2024, whatever pick you want for Hopkins. Yeah. I mean, I think if he's still out there, you know, if he hasn't been moved yet, he's certainly a, a, a bargaining chip on draft day. And that changes everything too. Again, I think what hurt the value right now of the wide receiver room, I think the NFL is catching up a little bit with where the actual value of receivers is. We saw maybe the last three years, a really explosion in the type of contracts that, and trades that teams are willing to do for aging. Yeah. Receivers. That Jacksonville um, deal for Christian Kirk is going to start to look like the exception more than the rule. I think. That even like the uh, the big trades for guys like Stephon Diggs, uh, guys like Tyree Kill, those big mega trades, they look good for everybody. Like everybody kind of works out, but you're also seeing a huge influx yearly of wide receiver talent. I think that the market is being saturated with really top end dudes and you can build pretty deep wide receiver rooms. And there's multiple ways every year to do this. You see those big Tyree trades, the stuff on digs trades, and then you see deep draft classes. So I think teams are starting to catch wind that like the, the Deandre Hopkins come along more often than you think the stuff on digs come around. Like there's always a disgruntled wide receiver that's looking to get out of a deal and, and make a trade somewhere in the league. Plus there's always guys shaking off loose from teams. So I think teams are just catching on wind to, Hey man, like Broncos, Cardinals, you guys need to calm down. You guys are t- living two years in the past on what you think these wide receiver values are. And the league is caught to a different standard now because of the influx of wide receiver. I think there's an interesting point to be made about draft value in general too. I mean, I've looked at kind of the board a billion times and thought about trading back and thought about how we can maneuver to get more picks or use picks to get someone we want. And it's like, I think about how the Patriots approach it. And I know it's the forbidden team, but when they took Cole Strange, everyone was freaking out. And naturally, Cole Strange, I think, had a third-round projection or, like, an early fourth or something. But, you know, they used him as a starter. And I didn't watch Patriots games this year. But according to the people I know that did, they were pretty impressed with his development. I'm not saying the Bills need to go for a fourth-round player. But I do think when you're in the muddy waters at the end of the round, the 27th pick, I think there's more, like you said before, Aaron, more justification and more – honestly acceptance to kind of reach for a player because if you think this person in the middle of the second round where you sit you know you're not going to get there you know unless you have to make some insane maneuvers to get to the from 59 to like late 30s early 40s I think it's okay to reach I think it's okay to get someone that you have enough confidence in to be a starter on your team and make that move because at the end of the day all that matters is how they play on the field. And if pick 27 was someone who was projected for the middle of the second round, winds up being your starting linebacker with a fifth-year option, I'm not against it. And I really think that that's something that more teams should be considerate of because, yeah, the board matters. Value does matter to an extent. But plenty of first-round value players go down and don't end up being anything. And then plenty of mid-round picks become great. So, yeah, if it were deep receiver class, if you see someone at 27 or a linebacker or an anybody that you think is worth it and not too far away, I think it's okay to take the reach and get someone that you think could be a starter on your team. Yeah, I agree with that. I think this um, is going to be a very interesting draft to watch from – being in his front office's philosophy because I do think every year when they, people say, hey, B never does this, he kind of just goes and does something that nobody expects, whether it's taking, you know, uh, multiple edges uh, in, in a draft where nobody really anticipated that, right? Um, 
going cornerback round one. There was a ton of memes and mocking them not addressing that position to need and, and going there round one. People said he wouldn't do it. And so uh, you also like it's really uh, odd to me. We're talking about this running back room and how it's like really filled out. And even Greg and I talked about it. But yet Brandon Bean and company are still whining and dining running backs all around the nation. Like that seems like a weird way to invest money if you're not somewhat interested in that position Bijan, going Rocha, for like Tajay Spears yeah man they're in on all these guys yeah, like, and they're not just like hey they showed up at the pro day it's uh sending people out there going to dinners holding private workouts with your coach like that's a legitimate investment for an NFL team to get all those guys out there and do that and so there has to be like a legitimate interest there right like I, I can't be crazy did they do that with um, Reese Hall, ETN, uh, Najee Harris? Did they, you know, do any of those workouts, dinner, whatever, with any of those guys? I don't remember specifically those guys. I remember ETN. Um, yes, I remember them being in on ETN. I don't remember Brees as much, but um... yeah. And we got to remember some of there were some restrictions in the last whatever through that COVID stretch of how a lot of it was um, Zoom meetings right like teams weren't even allowed to have people in the building through a stretch of covid drafts i think if they i think you know my gut is if if they can or my gut is they think if they can pair an elite um workhorse type back with james cook and have that be your like duo and then you know naheem hines is around to fill his role um damian harris maybe becomes um, expendable, although you know it depends on obviously uh, the off- how the off season goes and where they think um, they need the value. Right? Wh- who's gonna? Well, that's the sort of the weird thing though is they they filled this room by restructuring Hines and getting Damian Harris. Like you have some get str- it's a good amount to uh, spend on your running back room. Like Greg said, that's really ideally where he'd like to be forever and always. But you have some you're on the hook for some of that money and it's not substantial. You could take a dead cap hit, but then that becomes a sort of loose asset allocation at a position. If you're spending a high round pick, it's not somebody you're going to put on the practice squad. It's someone you're going to have to keep on your roster and, and utilize. And so now what do you do? Do you release one of these guys and eat, some money for a guy that you just got to fill a position. It's just a weird spot to be. Maybe in you try to trade one with of asset them. allocation. Like, yeah, it's t- it's it's it would be a weird. It would be a, um, an interesting thing to see what happens with that room if they draft a Bijan, for example. Yeah, I like scenarios where we have too much talent. Exactly. Not sure what to do with it. Those are my favorite. Just like to the tackle tackle conversation mm-hmm. earlier. You know, I would love to have a tackle problem where we're like, oh, Spencer Brown really popped. What do I'd we rather do? have that than a running back problem well, now we have too because many those are high. Yeah. Those are high value dudes. I mean, if you tell me you've yeah. got three Spencer starting Brown had tackles a great summer. and yeah. you can now trade yes. Deion Dawkins, that's an option. And, you know, then you've got Spencer Brown and let's say Darnell Wright on rookie contracts for a couple of years. Uh, I yeah. mean, yeah. OK, what? Well, and let's. But end on that because I do got to get going here. I got to get my kid April vacation starting now. So pray for me, guys. I got my kids for a full week uh, by myself with this just terrible weather. It's going to be uh, just pray for me. Help me. But talking about some of the, um, you know, those value signings. I, I was talking to a lot of people about the Bills picks because they're not names that everyone was familiar with. If, you don't, if you're not on Twitter and you're not paying a lot of attention all the time, especially those interior offensive linemen guys, like, why do we need so many? You know, is what a thing I was hearing. Why'd they invest so much there? And at these, like, kind of not sure if they're improvement guys. And I was like, well, I think they're improvements, one, over Saffold. And two, like, for me, you can't have too many guys. Like, if they all hit, this is the best problem I've ever had uh, along the interior offensive line. I've been complaining about it for years. I feel like that is how the Bills' whole free agency really is wrapped up. So I'd love to kind of go around this roundtable real quick with everybody before we peace out and say, you know, we are heading into full draft season now. I think if any moves come, it's going to either be that big high end D hop type trade or Beckham, or it's going to just be like low end. Hey, we need some bodies to get in here before the draft type stuff. I think it's pretty much slowed down on free agency standpoint. How do you feel about this Bill's free agency as a whole? We'll start with Chris and work our way here through everybody. Uh, I mean, I've been pretty happy with it. The, 
we've got the, the only thing is that linebacker spot. I feel like, and every day that goes by that they don't add a free agent at the, at the linebacker spot just makes me more convinced that they don't see it as the glaring need that the fan base sees it as. Um, because you know that just the, the philosophy of that front office is to fill needs through free agency. So you don't have to do that in the draft. You can take, take the best player who's there when you're up. So, uh, I mean, I like how they've been making these incremental improvements at, at positions across the roster. Um, you know, th they're just making smart moves. They're not throwing a ton of cash around, which is important right now as Josh is getting into the expensive years of his contract. So um, I, I like what they've been doing. I'm really, really curious to see what happens at linebacker. That's the position that it's like, it feels like it's not settled. Um, but <laughs> I think that, uh, I think Brandon and Sean and, and their guys think it's more settled than we do. AJ, yeah. oh, go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead and zone. Yeah. I, I was just going to say, yeah, I'll probably give it an overall grade of a B. Um, I was flirting with saying C plus, but I think overall we knew that they didn't have too much money to throw around to get any real big names, but they've been able to, add some depth at key positions. They've been able to add a little bit to the skill position. I know we all wanted to get the splashy name already. I mean, we're three, four weeks into free agency. Really haven't had any big, big splashes. But I think the guys that they did add, you know, offensive line at the wide receiver position, even re-signing Jordan Phillips and, and grabbing Damian Harris um, in the running back room, I think those were all good, solid moves. So I would say probably a B overall but i do agree with chris about the whole linebacker situation i'm definitely curious to see how they address that in the draft and um i think someone mentioned it earlier too maybe it means that there's a shift in philosophy maybe that means that they get a little more aggressive and blitz more maybe bernard is the guy after all and they go with an undersized middle linebacker who can just kind of run around the field like milano um and and, and like I said, maybe they have a plan there that we just don't know because every day that goes by, it does make you think, hmm, they know something that we don't or they are for sure on round one or round two getting that linebacker that they really want. So I guess we'll find out in the next four weeks. But like I said, overall, be great. And um, just waiting to see uh, what the draft look like. Yeah, so I'll go with – I'm going a little higher end and I'll just give my reasons why. I want A-. minus. Um, just because of the cap situation. I think Brandon Bean was patient. I think bringing back Jordan Poyer um, for $5 million and also adding Taylor Rapp was just something that no Bills fan had on their radar. Um, or anyone, actually, in the whole – I don't think anyone thought that was even a possibility. I think you upgrade the left guard position with a young 25-year-old instead of going that veteran route that they've been going the last couple of years with Daryl Williams-type guy at the tackle position or, or a uh, you know Roger Saffold. I think they had a depth in the interior, re-signing Bogger, but while also signing Edwards from L.A., who's had 45 starts over his career. Um, the receiver room, I think it was cost-effective. Guys with potential. The Hardy deal is basically a one-year one year prove-it deal. If you do good enough and stay healthy, you know you can play that second year. Sherfield's another guy that I think will be a good special teams guy with a little better route running and the ability to, you know, when he catches the ball, getting upfield. And then just the re-signing to Dane Jackson, people forget about that. I think that's important. Um, the re-signing of Jordan Phillips is important if he can stay healthy. And then <clears throat> obviously the addition of Damian Harris for $1.7 million, I think is just going to be very important for this offense. They've, been, they've tried it with Zach Moss. It didn't work. They need that element of a guy that can get in the end zone and take that pressure off Josh. So overall, if they can hit on the draft – you know, I think address the middle linebacker position, grab a receiver, receiver bring in some tackle competition. Uh, I think this is an A minus across the board and going into the season. Like, a, like you know, you think it's not as bad as it seems. When the year ended, everyone, you know, people thought that some maybe that this team wasn't going to be as good. But I'll, I'll tell you right now, I think this roster with Hyde and Poyer and Vaughn potentially coming back, Trey White. I think this roster got better, um, and that's even before the draft, so I'll go with an A-. minus. Nice. Joe, you got anything to add here before we split? 
Yes. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, I kind of agree with everybody. Uh, we knew going into the draft. Joe might be. Uh, he might be slamming those weights. You guys can't hear me. <laughs> I think he might be having wi- Wi-Fi issues or something at the gym. I can. Oh, you can. Oh, my bad. I'll shut up. <laughs> AJ. Okay, sorry guys. Yeah, I'm probably in a weird spot, but. I'll keep it quick then. Um, give it an A, considering that we knew they weren't going to be making expensive moves and that the limitations were there. I think B got some great talent for great value. Shearfield being an elite run blocker, Damian Harris being a very good running back, only two years removed from 15 touchdowns. I really like the Deontay Hardy side and considering what it could do for the offense and give it a new dimension. So I'm very pleased with how Bean's handled this. I think we knew it wasn't going to be anything expensive, which is why I'm much more forgiving of the kind of one-year deal, low value, not really long-term options. They couldn't really get away with that. So I'll give it an A, and if they get this Hopkins, it gets uh, A++. Awesome. All right, guys. I appreciate everybody who took time, uh, Zyrus, uh, and I'm going by in the zone because I am terrible at names. That I forgot yeah, what Chris Bell. said. Yeah, it's Bell. Bell. It's Bell. Bell. It's What's going on, Bell? Sorry. Up, uh, thank you guys for your time. I appreciate you guys coming on. Uh, <laughs> let people let people know where they can find you real quick. Yes. Yeah, so if you see the in the zone uh, profile right in this, you can just click and you can add us on here. We got all of our information in the file, so you can. Find us on YouTube, subscribe to our channel, or you can listen to our In The Zone with DNZ podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcasts. We do it once a week. We normally drop on Wednesdays or Thursdays by 12 p.m. But, yeah, if you give us a follow, we keep everyone posted. Um, This is only our second season doing it. And uh, two guys from Buffalo that love to talk sports, love to talk Bills football. And, uh, yeah, buckle up. Awesome. Yeah, you guys should be. Yeah, we appreciate you guys letting us hop on today. And excuse the background noise. Uh, my wife drove me to a consignment shop that just opened up this morning, so I've been here trying to duck all the noise. But we appreciate y'all letting us come on with you guys today. Yeah, thanks for joining. You guys listening, be sure to check these guys out. They got a good podcast that's, uh, like they said, just started up their second season. Um, yeah. You know, I know Joe's, uh, and sorry for the, I don't know what's going on, why I couldn't hear Joe before, but uh, you know, <laughs> I'll have to catch it on the replay. Spaces yeah, right. happens. <laughs> uh, Joe, you got uh, a show coming up here this weekend? Yes, sir. Uh, Aaron, you can hear me, right? I can, yep. Okay, cool, yeah. Just want to make sure for the playback. But tomorrow, under review, 11 a.m., everybody, come hang out. It's a little bit of a different episode. We're talking about the landscape of the AFC as a whole after free agency and looking ahead to the draft. I got Cover One's Pro Ant coming on. I got... Your guy, Aaron, Pat Moran, coming on. And then I also have Joe Goodberry, uh, our Bengals friend, coming on as well. So a nice little panel tomorrow. Talk about the AFC, and we're going to have a good time. So tomorrow, 11 a.m., all cover one streaming platforms. Come hang out with me. We're going to have a great time. Very cool. And as always, you can catch uh, Greg, myself, uh, every Wednesday night. Uh, Actually, I lie. Next week, it's going to be Tuesday night because Greg is traveling. So we're a little wonky right now with travel, but we we are going to be live for you every week. Make sure you're just subscribed to the whole Cover One YouTube platform. So many great uh, content creators uh, and and really writers throughout our entire staff. So make sure you're following everybody. Uh, They're hustling and grinding this time of year to get you guys all the info you need. Tons of great content at YouTube. So if you're mad that we're ending this and you want to keep hearing bills talk there is fresh content for you up on the youtube channel right now put it on at work pretend like you're doing something put it on while you're hanging out with your kids whatever you got to do uh and that's wait, it guys wait, Go hold bills. on a sec man i gotta get one oh. thing in real quick tonight yep. tonight tonight devin levi's first start we're gonna be on playback to check that out so um you guys head over to playback.tv slash cover one we're going to be watching uh, the Sabers and the Rangers, and should be should be great. Devin's first start, and everyone's nice. excited to see. Is he the next Ryan Miller or Dominic Ashik? I don't know, but uh, he's, he looks pretty good. I have no idea what any of that means except for playback. I hope I hope Sabers fans have fun because they deserve it. So I hope you guys all jump in there on playback and have fun watching something good happen for the Sabers. Um, even though I don't know what any of it means, I wish you all nothing but the best. Uh, go Bills. Go Bills. Nice go guys. Bills. Go Bills.